Hello and welcome to the channel. This is the first video in our SystemD series. Today we are exploring CPU limiting using slices and services. We'll cover creating services, configuring slices, and demonstrating how to control CPU usage effectively. My name is Philip. let's get started. SystemD is a comprehensive system that manages different aspects of Linux like service management, resource allocation, logging, device management, timers, logging sessions, network configuration, and much more. It would be much easier to list stuff that SystemD is not doing than to list everything it's responsible for. Today, we'll just briefly touch upon a few basic concepts, just enough to get you started. So let's dive in. At the heart of SystemD are its units the basic building blocks of its functionality. Let's create our first uh, systemd unit. We are going to make a simple service, which is the most common type of systemd unit. First, we need to create the service file. Systemd stores these files in the etc systemd system directory, so let's go there. Next, we'll create a new file for our service. Let's call it ping.service. Now, the name is important because the part after the dot, in our case service, tells systemd what kind of unit this is. Inside this file, I will define two sections, unit and service. In the unit section, I will add a description. This part is optional, but trust me, it's worth doing. Adding a meaningful description helps you understand what this service does later on. For example, ping service. In the service section, I will define the main process for this service using the exec start parameter. Exec start is the command this service will run. You need the full path to the executable. Here, it's uh, user bin ping. I'm pinging my default gateway, that's 192.168.10.200, and sending 10 packets with the dash C10 flag. Then let's set the restart to always. This means the service will restart no matter how the process ends, whether it exits cleanly or crashes. Restart sec equals 10 sets a 10 second delay before the service restarts. This avoids immediately restarting the process in case of issues. Once we've saved the file, we need to tell systemd to pick up the changes. That's all done with the daemon reload command. This reloads all the units, files, and refreshes systemd configuration. Let's check the status of our new service to make sure systemd recognize it. To do that, I will issue systemctl status followed by the service name. You will see the details like the service name, type, and description. Loaded indicates that the configuration file does not have any errors. There's also a path to the configuration file as well as the information that the service is not running. Now, let's start the service with systemctl start and the service name. Once it's running, we can monitor it with watch-n1 command. This continuously updates the status every second so we can see what's happening. Here's what we are looking at. Active state, this tells us the service is running. PIT, the process ID of the ping command. Then there's the accounting information. This includes things like how much traffic the service has sent and received, disk IO, memory usage, and CPU time. Finally, we see the logs. They are pulled directly from systemd's journal and show what's happening with the service. Now, here's something cool. When the ping command finishes, after sending 10 packets, the service enters an activating state. That's because we set it to always restart, but with a 10 seconds delay. After waiting, the service restarts and the process begins again. And that's it. We've successfully created a simple systemd service that runs a ping command, restarts automatically, and gives us all kinds of useful stats. You can use the same approach to create more complex services tailored to your needs. So what have we learned so far? If you got a background process or a daemon running on a Linux system, like let's say a web server, you should absolutely configure it as a systemd service. Why? Because it gives you some really powerful benefits. First off, systemd lets you define exactly how your program should start and stop. But it's not just about running a command, it's about control. You can define dependencies. So, for example, your web server won't even try to start until the network service is up and running. That's huge for making sure everything works in the right order. And it gets better. Systemd services can also respond to triggers. You can configure them to start or stop based on all kinds of events. A new connection to a TCP port, a file being modified, specific times or intervals, you name it. Another big advantage is restart policies. If your process crashes or exits for any reason, systemd can 
automatically restart it according to the rules you define. So you don't have to stress about downtime. Systemd got your back. Then there's resource tracking. Systemd keeps tabs on how much memory, CPU and other resources your service is using. And if you need to, you can impose limits to prevent a single process from hogging all the system resources. Plus, Systemd integrates with centralized logging, so all your services logs are in one place. No more hunting around for where your logs ended up. It's all organized for you. So in short, Systemd services provides a really efficient way to manage background processes on Linux. They give you fine-grade control, reliability through restart policies, resource tracking, and even logging all built in. The service unit in Systemd is responsible for managing background processes. Let's shift gears and explore another unit type, a slice. What exactly does a slice do? Let's dive in and see it in action. First, I will navigate to the etc systemd system folder. Here, I will create a file named slice400. Notice the dot slice extension. It's what tells systemd that this is a unit of type slice. We'll start with a familiar section, unit. Inside, I will add a simple description. Next, I will add a slice section. This is where the configuration happens. I will set the CPU quota to 400%. What does it mean? It allows any service assigned to a slice to consume up to 400% CPU, which is equivalent to four full CPU cores. Remember, 100% represents one core. To see this in action, let's take a look at CPU hog service that I've prepared. It's a CPU intensive process designed to consume all available resources on our 8 core machine. I will reload the systemd unit files, then start the service. If I switch to another console running the BTOP application, you'll see that all 8 cores are maxed out. Now let's stop the CPU hog service. Next, I will modify the CPU hog service file to assign it to the slice 400 slice we created earlier. I will add the following line, slice equals slice 400 dot slice. Now I will reload the unit files again and start the service. Back in BTOP, you will notice something interesting. CPU utilization is now capped slightly above 50%. Why? Because we are on an eight core system and the slice limits the service to four cores or 400% CPU. Let's tweak this further. Let's edit the slice 400 slice file again. This time I will change the CPU quota to 200%. After reloading the configuration and checking BTOP, you will see the overall CPU utilization drops from 50% to 25%. Now the slice allows only two cores to be used. This demonstrates how you can dynamically adjust resource limits with system slices. It's a powerful way to control and manage system resources efficiently. Another powerful feature of systemd slices is their ability to organize and manage multiple services under a single resource limit. Let's see how that works. First, I will create a second service based on our existing CPU hog service. Then I will edit the new file. In this file, I will update the description to make it clear this is the second CPU hog service. Once that's saved, I will reload the systemd configuration and then start the second service. If we check the resource graph in BTOP, you will notice something interesting. CPU utilization hasn't increased. To get a more detailed view of what's happening, I will switch to a tool called systemd cgtop. This tool shows the resource usage for C groups or control groups. C groups are a Linux kernel feature that lets you group processes and manage their resource usage. The hierarchy here works like a file system. At the top, there's the root C group, which shows the total resource usage for all processes on the system. Below that, we see our slice 400 slice, which is limited to 200% CPU or two full cores. Underneath the slice, there are two services, CPU hog and CPU hog 2. If you look at the CPU utilization, they are roughly the same. Each service is taking more or less 100% CPU, that's a single core. But the key point is, the total CPU usage for both services never exceeds the 200% limit set by the parent slice. Over time, the CPU usage between the two services may even out, but they will always remain constrained by the slice resource limit. This demonstrates how slices allow you to efficiently manage resources across multiple services, ensuring no single service or group of services exceeds the limits you've defined. Let's do one more thing. 
I will stop both services. Next, I will edit the slice 400 slice configuration file to adjust its CPU settings. I will revert the CPU quota to 400%, which is equivalent to four CPU cores, half of our system's total capacity. Additionally, I will set the CPU affinity to limit processes in this slice to specific cores, 0 to 3. This means that processes or services in this slice can run only on CPU cores 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now let's create a child slice under slice 400. To define the child slice, I will use the dash notation. The parent is slice 400 and the child will be child 25. First, I will add a description and then configure this child slice to use 25% of the CPU power. Mind that I'm using the CPU weight option and not CPU quota option. Let's create another child slice named slice 400 child 75. This slice will be set to use 75% of the CPU power using CPU weight. The CPU weight parameter determines the relative share of CPU resources. In this setup, slice 400 child 25 gets 25%, that's one core, and slice 400 child 75 gets 75%, that's three cores, of the parent slice four core CPU quota. Finally, I will assign each service to the appropriate slice. Let's update the CPU hook service to use the slice 400 child 25 slice. Now, for CPU hook 2, I will assign it to slice 400 child 75 slice. Let's reload the configuration and start both services. If we look at the BTOP, the total CPU utilization is 50%, which aligns with the 400% quota, that's 4 cores. However, due to CPU affinity setting, the load is concentrated on cores 0 to 3, with this course running at 100% utilization. To examine the CPU usage distribution between services, let's switch to system DCG top. Here we see the parent slice, that's slice 400, consuming 400% CPU, that's 4 cores. CPU hook 2 uses about 3 cores, while CPU hook uses 1 core, maintaining the 3 to 1 ratio specified by the CPU weight. Now, let's explore the difference between CPU quota and CPU weight. I will stop the CPU hook 2 service. Looking again at system D CG top, notice that the remaining service, that is CPU hook, now uses the full CPU power within the slice 400 limit. Let's restart CPU hook 2. As expected, the CPU allocation returns to 3 to 1 ratio, with CPU hook using 1 core and CPU hook 2 using 3 cores. This demonstrates that CPU quota enforces strict limits, while CPU weight dynamically adjusts based on available resources. Now you know how to effectively limit CPU usage with systemd. Try these techniques on your own system and let me know in the comments how it goes. In future videos, I will show you how to limit memory and I.O. We'll talk about how to configure a service to start automatically with the operating system and how to manage service dependencies. We'll also discuss other types of systemd units like scopes, timers, sockets, paths, and mounts. I'd also want to show you other systemd functionalities like logging, networking, DNS resolution, or encryption. So stick around for that. There's a lot more to explore. If you found this video helpful, please like, share, and subscribe for more systemd tutorials.